Welcome to Advanced Data Analysis 1 with me, Eric Gerhardt, Professor of Statistics at the University of New Mexico. In this video, we'll be continuing Chapter 2 on One Sample Inference. So here we are at the web page. I'm going to page on down to Chapter 2, and we'll pick up where we left off in the first video here. So we're currently on page 18. Things may change as I update these notes but here we are today. Our example, so we've just covered, if I page up for a moment, uh, performing uh, confidence intervals and understanding what a confidence interval is and assessing normality assumptions using the bootstrap. Now we will apply this to an example of age at first heart transplant. So we'll go through basic, sort of like a hand calculation, but um, I'll show it also in R for this data. So the steps of a performing the confidence interval is to first define the population parameter both in notation, mu, and in words, the mean age at the time of the first heart transplant of a population of patients. The second part is to calculate the summary statistics. So here are our data. We have 11 heart transplant patients, and these are their ages when they first got their heart transplants. We have one person here who's a bit younger, a 33-year-old. Other than that, everyone is, um, well, 42, 49, up to 64. A lot of people in their 50s. So we have a sample size of 11, a mean of 51, and a standard deviation of about eight years. That means that our standard error of the mean, which is our standard deviation divided by the square root of the sample size, is about two and a half years. So that's the basically like the uncertainty in our mean is two and a half years. All right, our degrees of freedom for our t distribution is the sample size minus one. 10 is our degrees of freedom. Uh, we can find the t critical value from uh, a table or you can calculate it using r and in this case um, the t critical value which is typically a little bit larger than 2 is 2.228 that's based on the degrees of freedom of 10 and finally the basically the margin of error um, for our interval is the t statistic or t critical value times our standard error so 2.2 times two and a half which is 5.5 so that is half of the width of our confidence interval our confidence interval is the mean okay it was 51.3 roughly plus or minus that margin of error 5.5 and so our confidence interval, if you calculate the lower bound, which I'm here specifying as L, and the upper bound goes from 45 up to almost 57. And that is our confidence interval. And if we were to, the interpretation of that is that in 95% of samples that we would conduct in this way of drawing 11 patients who need heart transplants, and calculating their sample statistics, 95% of the intervals that we calculate in this way will contain the true population mean of age at first heart transplant. This interval may or may not con contain the true value, and we don't know. But before we drew the sample, we know that the procedure is 95% likely to actually contain that true value. And then uh, we'll check the assumptions um, in a few pages. In fact, I just can't wait. This looks like the data right here. All right, so if we read the data in, so I've paged down to about page 24, and we'll just look at um, the, the data here is contained in a variable age, and we've used the bootstrap function that I wrote and this is the distribution of the data, those 11 observations. 
and this distribution is the estimate of the sampling distribution of the mean. And so the question here is, is the black curve close enough to the red curve, right, the black estimates the data, um, meaning the uh, sampling distribution of the mean based on the data, and the red curve is the normal distribution. Is, are, are those two curves basically the same? And there's a little bit of left skewness here because of the extreme observation, the young person. Uh, you know, actually look at this data. Really symmetric except for this one young person. So without this one young person, this data is basically perfect <laughs> in terms of a normality assumption. Uh, and, but it's that one observation that's causing a little bit of skewness in this black curve. Uh, it's a little bit, the black curve undershoots the right tail a little bit, and it, it's a little bit too heavy. There's some uh, samples out here, sample means out here that are maybe more extreme than we would expect from the normal distribution. This is probably not too bad. Um, I don't know, I'm sort of on the fence here. I would probably, what I would do in practice is I would report the result of this t-test, and then I would go to chapter 6 and do the non-parametric version of this, or of this confidence interval, I mean, and then perform a non-parametric version of the confidence interval and report both. And if, you know, if they're basically the same, that suggests that you're getting the same inference whether you assume normality or not. And that gives you some sense of robustness that, that your results probably aren't going to change very much whether you assume normality or not. All right, so I'm paging way up. And so there is our example, age at heart, plant, heart transplant. Good. Uh, I can ask you, if you were to change your the size of your confidence interval, say instead of a 95% confidence interval, say a 90% confidence interval, would it be wider or narrower? And the language right here says so. So, you, you know, that interval that you calculate <clears throat> is the probability that your interval captures the true population parameter in, in you know, an upcoming random sample one that hasn't happened yet. And so the wider it is, the more likely you are to capture the parameter. And so wider and more confident go together. So if you have less confidence, say 90%, that will be a, a narrower interval. All right, hypothesis testing. So hypothesis testing is used to make a decision. We specify um, a null hypothesis, which is, uh, which we'll call mu naught. So, why do we call it not? So, not is N A U G H T. That's the British way of pronouncing the word zero. Uh, when they play tic tac toe over there, they call it knots and crosses. Knots are the zeros or the O's, and crosses are the X's, X's and O's. Knots and crosses. So, we call this. Um, mu naught, and this is the value of that we are hypothesizing, which is hypothesizing to be the true mean of the population, and we're going to ask, is it or isn't it? Typically, the null hypothesis is the boring status quo value of the of the population. For example, you might say. Um, you know, is you might be testing whether what a treatment that you've imposed on some plants, for example, you know, whether adding fertilizer made these plants grow more than the not adding it. And so status quo would be the standard growth of plants. And then if you add fertilizer, um, that would, we expect it to grow more. So this mu naught would be sort of the standard or status quo or boring situation. And we want to know whether whether actual real life is different from boring. So null is the is what we hypothesize, and then there's an alternative which can take three forms. One is not equal, 
And the other alternatives is that maybe the true population is greater than the hypothesized, or it's less than. All right, so we're going to focus on not equal for now. And we've got similar steps for setting up a hypothesis test. First thing you do is set up the hypotheses both in words and notation. So you can say the population mean for the thing that you're studying is different from some value, maybe mu not equal zero, for example, for no change. And notation, H not is going to be our null hypothesis, colon, mu, the population mean, equals this specified value. So this mu not actually takes a value. You know, it's 4, or it's 23, or it's 0. It's some number. And mu is unknown. And we're asking whether this unknown quantity equals this specified version. Versus, and there's different ways of specifying the alternative. Sometimes you can put an A, or you could just do mu 1 to contrast it from mu 0. And this is the alternative. Mu doesn't equal that null hypothesis. And notice that the not equals says that the true population mean could be greater than or it could be less than. As long as it's different, that's what the symbol means. Not equal means different. Then you want to choose the size or the significance level of the test. You know, this is the probability that you um, make the wrong decision given that the null hypothesis is actually true. So you might give yourself a 5% chance of being wrong, for example. Uh, you might ask, why don't you give yourself a 0% chance of being wrong? And we'll get to that in a second. You need, you need to have some chance of being wrong. Otherwise, you can't be right in the other situation that when the alternative is true. Then you compute a test statistic, which will be a T statistic. It's basically sort of like a, a Z score, right? We have, we have the value minus the mean divided by the standard error, which is the standard deviation of the mean. And so this T statistic will be centered at zero, and it will have a standard deviation basically close to one, uh, but the T statistic you know, has a slightly wider distribution than the normal distribution. And finally, uh, You'll, te you'll compute whether our t statistic from our data is different from a critical value, which is based on that 5% chance of being wrong, alpha equals 0.05. And if it's more extreme than that t, statistic, that t critical value, then we'll state our conclusion that we reject the null. So, uh, you know, we're basically going to look at p-values, so I'm going to focus on p-values instead. So we'll talk about p-values in a second. So p-value will be less than 0.05, which is alpha. Then we'll reject the null. Basically, if it's if we have a t-statistic, which is extreme, then that suggests that the null hypothesis is not correct. Otherwise, we fail to reject the null. That's when the t-statistic is basically close to zero. So if we look at the formula for t statistic for a second, here's our hypothesized mean, mu naught. Here's what we observed. If these two values are close to each other, that's going to be close to zero. And so if our t if our null hypothesis is true, then this difference will be close to zero. Our t statistic will be close to zero. In the other case, when the sample mean is very different from the hypothesized mean, then our t statistic will be large, either positive or negative. And so that leads to the decision of rejecting when the t statistic is very different from the critical value, which is going to be equivalent to this p value less than alpha. Otherwise, if it's close to zero, we fail to reject the null. We do not accept H naught and expect to uh, lose full credit if you ever say accept H naught. And I'll expand on this later. Um, basically, we are assuming H naught is true, and then we are assessing evidence against it. We can't accept something that we assume. Um, we never actually have the ability to um, accept the null hypothesis. We can only reject it. And of course, we need to check our model assumptions to see whether 
the sampling distribution of the mean is normal. And so here's what this process looks like. Let me zoom in on this a bit. So here's our t distribution. It's centered at zero and um, it's symmetric and it's slightly wider than a normal distribution. Our, so let's say that alpha equaled 0.05. Then this white area in the center here, if you were to integrate this curve between these two gray lines, um, you'd get 95% or 0.95. That leaves 5% chance for error. That 5% chance is this right gray tail, alpha over two. So this is 0.025 out here. And same thing on the left tail. And the T critical value says what the T statistic is that separates the central 95% from the extremes. And if, you're, if you get a T statistic somewhere close to zero in the white area, you fail to reject the null. That is, you, your data is not compelling enough to, to say that the null is incorrect. But if you get something in the gray area, then that is our rejection region. And we will reject H0 out there. All right. So p-values are often a way to summarize the evidence that we have that the null hypothesis is correct. So um, let's say that we calculated a t-statistic that equaled ts, OK? And so these bars around ts are the absolute value. So we have a, a positive value of absolute value of ts, and we have a, a negative value. And the p-value is the, here it is, p-value is the chance of obtaining data favoring the alternative by this much or more. I guess I prefer this definition here. A p-value is the probability of ob observing a sample mean at least as extreme as the one you observed, assuming that the null hypothesis is true. So let's say that the, you know, let's give ourselves an example that in fact the true population mean equaled zero. We draw a sample, we calculate the mean, and we calculate the t-statistic, which was, I'll page up for a second, our observed sample mean minus, say, zero, divided by the standard error of, of, the, of the sample mean, which we calculated in this way, standard deviation divided by square root of n. We get this t-statistic. Now, if mu naught, say, in this simple case, that zero was the true value, then we would expect our sample mean to be close to zero. But by random chance, sometimes we will draw a random sample where we just say we get a few large values greater than zero um, by chance. And so maybe our sample mean is, is positive by quite a bit, say positive two or positive three. Then that would that's a rare case. Most of the time it would be close to zero. Okay. And so even when the true population mean, I'll page down, even when the true population mean equals zero, there will be ch ch chances that we get extreme values of our t-statistic just because our random sample had a few extra large values and not enough small values to balance it out, okay? And so this p-value is the is the probability of observing something at least as extreme as what we saw. So here's our t-statistic. This gray area is the area that's more extreme than the t-statistic we saw. And notice that because our alternative was not equal, it can be more extreme in either direction, to the left or to the right. So when we integrate those areas and add them together, that is our p-value. It's the it's basically the tail probabilities of the distribution, where the tails of the distributions are the, the, the sloping bits of the left and right extremes. All right. 
This is an important definition to know for p-values. Oops. All right. So large p-values are consistent with the null hypothesis, and small p-values are not consistent with the null. Imagine, for example, that you had a p-value that equaled zero. Or no, sorry, sorry, sorry. So you got a t-statistic that equaled zero. Then your p-value, what's more extreme than zero? Everything. Our p-value is equal to one. So that is very consistent with the null hypothesis. If you had a t-statistic that was, you know, 100, that would be so far in the tail that the extremes are effectively zero. So that's a p-value that's close to zero. So the p-values, you can sort of think of it as being how consistent is the data with the null hypothesis. If it's large, it's consistent with the null. As it gets small, that's evidence against the null. All right, so we've talked a bit about these assumptions already in the previous video. Um, in this case, we have, uh, we are, let me just double check here, I'm paging down. We're gonna look at um, the age at first transplant again. And we had these 11 values, we calculate some summary statistics, the sample size, the mean, standard deviation, and the standard error of the mean. We're going to test the hypothesis that the mean at first transplant is 50 years old. So we want to know, is, is 50 the average age of someone getting a heart transplant? So let's define, uh, go through the stages of this hypothesis test. Mu is the mean age of patients at the first transplant. So we're defining our notation both in, or defining our parameter mu in both notation and in words. And we're going to define our hypothesis in notation in words as well. So we've already set it up here in words, test that the mean is equal to zero or not. That means mu equals zero, or sorry, <laughs> mu equals 50, and the alternative is mu is not equal to 50. So mu not is 50, and I've just substituted 50 wherever mu not was previously. Degrees of freedom is 11 minus 1, which is 10, and we can calculate our t-statistic. So ts, we've got our sample mean of 51 minus our hypothesized mean of 50 divided by 2.5 gives us a t-statistic of about a half. Now, a t-statistic that's, that's, you know, we're comparing our t-statistic, 0.5, to a t-critical value, which depends on our sample size. And notice this is a little bit larger than 2. So when we have t-statistics statistic, that are much larger than 2, say like 3, 4, 5, then we're going to end up rejecting the null. Otherwise, if it's close to 0, less than 2 in absolute value, then we're probably going to fail to reject the null. So in this case, this is pretty close to 0, zero the center. And so um, we're going to end up failing to reject the null here. Let's take a look at a picture here. Um, and there's two strategies we can take. On the left, I'll zoom in. This is our t distribution with 10 degrees of freedom. This uh, zero is the center. The white area is 95%. And 0.51 was our observed t statistic. And it's, it's basically inside this white area. So we're not going to reject the null. We needed this t statistic to be at least as large as 2.2, uh, .2, either positive or negative, to reject. And it wasn't, so we failed to reject. Another way to look at this is to look at the, the p-value. So if you, if you say ask what's more extreme than 0.51 in both the positive and negative direction and add up these two areas, you get an area of 0.62. That's the p-value. We compare that to our um, alpha level, which, are, which will typically be 0.05. So if I scroll up a little bit, alpha equals 0.05. That is our, what we'll learn in a moment, is our type 1 error, the probability of being wrong when the null hypothesis is actually true. Um, and because it's larger than alpha, we reject, or sorry, we fail to reject. So the, our what we observed is consistent with the null. All right.
So how do we do this in R? Pretty simple. So in this case, we just have 11 values. So I'm just uh, putting all that into a variable called age. And I'm going to plot the data. We saw these plots from chapter 1. So looks like we basically have a symmetric distribution except for one outlier on the left. So that's leading us to a bit of left skewness here. Uh, stem and leaf plot, and no one really uses these anymore. They're pretty interesting for small samples because the, you can actually get the values back. Um, the, to the left of the bar is the tens place, and to the right is the ones place. That's what this says up here. And so this is actually 33 is the smallest value, and then 42, and then 49, and then another 49, and so on. So we actually know from this plot what the original observations were. That's the advantage to using a stem and leaf plot. It's handy to make when you just got pen and, pen, pen and paper. We can calculate our t-critical value. Q stands for quantile, and t is for the t-distribution. And the area to the right that we want to consider is 1 minus, so alpha is 0.05 here. So because we're looking at symmetric tails, um, half of the 0.05 is 0.025. So that entire quantity is you know, 0.975, and we want to know what's more extreme than that. And uh, with the degrees of freedom, which is the length of age is n minus 1, so that's 11 minus 1, which is 10 degrees of freedom, and that value is 2.228. The, the picture for that, if I scroll up for a moment, is this right here. So we want to know where is this t critical value. So we need to figure out 95, uh, sort of 1 minus 95 plus, uh, you know, half of the 0 0.05, which is that tail area, which is 0 0.025. Okay, so that leads us to um, this point. Now scrolling back down. All right, the function we'll use. Uh, to do all this for us is called t.test and the simple thing to do is just put in age that's the data set that's the column of data that we're using and then we can specify the null hypothesis mu equals 50 there's other options uh, here in particular uh, the defaults are that the alternative hypothesis is a two-sided test rather than a one-sided greater or one-sided less than and with a confidence level of 95%. It's going to do that by default. I'm putting the result of the t-test into t.summary, and then I'm uh, printing the output below. And the output goes over two pages, but it tells us what the data set was, uh, what the t-statistic is, 0.51 degrees of freedom, the p-value is 0.62, those are values that we saw above. If we conduct a hypothesis test, this is telling us what our alternative hypothesis was, that the true mean is not equal to 50. That relates directly to this p-value. Those two are uh, go together. Finally, the 95% comes in here when we calculate the confidence interval. So it goes from 45.7 up to 56.8. These are all values that we've seen earlier in the chapter where we calculated these by hand. And finally, in the bottom, this is the, the mean, uh, the sample mean of our, um, from our data, 51.2. And what the heck, here's the summary, a uh, five number summary and the mean for the data we observed. If we check the assumptions, here we're using the bootstrap, here's the distribution of our observed data, Here's the sampling distribution of the mean, or at least a boot, the bootstrap approximation of that. And if we zoom in on this, we're asking whether the black curve, which is the bootstrap approximation of the mean, is that distribution is, is it close to the normal distribution, which is the red curve. And this is not too bad. There's a little bit of systematic difference, especially on the right tail. It's a little bit shorter than we'd expect. It means that the black curve drops down to the axis 
quicker than the red curve and we see observations out to the left that are more extreme than we would probably see under the red curve um, but this isn't probably too bad I would end up uh, doing this test both using the t-test and then I would go to chapter 6 do the non-parametric test to see whether our conclusions depend on the normality assumption if they do then I would worry and I would I would probably do away with the t-test and just focus on the non-parametric. Um, I don't want the results to be sensitive to the assumptions I, met, I make when those assumptions are in question. All right, I also have uh, written a function here to plot basically the, the p-value. And so if you put in to that function the summary from the t-test, it will make this plot and we can see that the shaded area which is the p-value is quite large um, I report that down here that it's 0.62 and the t-statistic is 0.51 therefore we would fail to reject our null hypothesis our data are pretty consistent with our null hypothesis that the population is mean is close to 50 alright uh, last detail here is that when you uh, let me page up for a moment All right. So in R, when you run a procedure like t-test and put that output into a summary object, there's lots of different ways you can use the information from that summary object. There's, there's a bunch of information here. So I'm going to page down for a second. We're going to look at that t-summary information. I've made the text small here because it's this is not of general interest. But there's, there's these nine objects in the t-summary object. Okay? And one way to look at, see what they are, is ask for the names of objects inside t.summary. So there's the statistic, which is the t-statistic. Okay? So t-summary dollar sign statistic will show you the t-statistic has a label t and the value is 0.51. What's the parameter? This is the degrees of freedom for our t distribution. What's the p-value for our test? That's 0.62 and so on. So if you wanted to actually report some of these values um, you can access them directly. For example this is the p-value so you could print that in your report if you wanted to. All right. So I go through and I output all of those. So have a look if you like. Um, I go through another example. I encourage you to look at this on your own about meteorites. It's a fairly interesting example about um, the cooling rate of meteorites um, that hang out, um, is flying around in the universe. And we were asking about a specific theory about the cooling rate which relates to uh, the way the universe works. All right. So I'm going to stop there. I'm going to come back and finish this chapter with one more video about the mechanics of setting up a hypothesis test. It's, this, is, this next topic is, is quite critical to understand about um, what the state of nature is, how you make decisions, and the types of errors you can make. So come on back.